and Carlisle came in at um, 84,000. So I asked Roland, is this company legit? Can they, uh, can they do it? And he checked and said yes. So then from there, he went up um, 10 percent from 84 to 92. And then from 92, it went up 20% to 109. And then from 109, uh, it went up uh, 22% to 132. And now, uh, because uh, it has been predicted that there's going to be um, a busy storm season, um, I can only, um, you know, with the experience that I have, I'm not an insurance, but uh, uh, can uh, come in, but also is that the higher the risk, the higher of, of pricing that, that we're going to get. Now, and personally, my insh my uh, windstorm insurance uh, went up a good a good amount of, uh, of money. I just renewed it about a month ago. But that's kind of like the you know if we only have one participating, but we do we did our due diligence well, and I think procurement did excellent in getting this. Um, RFP out, you know, when you have uh, 100 companies throughout the United States and some in Texas that do not want to participate, they see the high risk. I say <coughs> that we were blessed to have at least one. I know some other uh, entities, government entities, their insurance uh, company uh, have been um, uh, canceled uh, because of the high risk. And so that's my best answer I can give you. But Roland, can you sign in on this uh, concern, please? Yeah, uh, a couple of things. Uh, and, and very good points that you're bringing up, uh, uh, Director Allison. Uh, I'm sorry, I keep hearing that feedback. Throw me off a little bit. You're okay. You sound okay. I can hear you. Okay, okay. I'm going to turn down the volume here. Anyway, uh, so. I don't have the information going back to you know, the last three years. Um, I, I will tell you that in 2017, it was one of the largest catastrophic years um, from, from my understanding of, of, of how the business works. And, and talking to my colleagues in the business, you know, this isn't my bailiwick, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I'm obviously, I've always been general. It's not my bailiwick, but, you know, staff invites me in just simply because I know the market and I know the community. And so, I, I kind of help them as a bridge to understand because, you know, we obviously want to be conscientious that, you know, as Mike said, are we comfortable with this company? Uh, you know, when Carlisle came in four years ago, they borrowed in a very, very creative plan in the sense that typically you just go out to one carrier. Uh, they, they spread out the risk over three different carriers. And I remember when they came up with it, I was just, I said, gosh, that's so creative with the things that they do. And so that way, they can they can reduce the rate and that's when we came in at a very low when it, you know you hardly hear that rates go down and we came in at eighty four thousand. Uh, the challenges that we're facing with this year in particular is number one, twenty twenty one was uh, had the second most costly global global losses uh, for companies across the board, and they're obviously having to relook at their manual rates. So that way they can assess how they're gonna how they're gonna calculate risk. Uh, you know, then you compound that with uh, inflation. So the uh, the market has gone up uh, ridiculously, as as we see all around the nation with all kinds of things. Uh, the other challenge that that we dealt with is I, I do believe that the procurement staff did all their due diligence on a conventional system. Unfortunately, now, the way insurance works, and many of you may know this from the private sector, is you typically stick with one broker or one agent or uh, 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 that you know of and that you have a comfort level with and that you let them shop the market. And carriers now in this market of uh, all these losses, they're, sti they're basically sticking with a care, uh, 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 brokers or, or agents that they have a comfort level with. So in this procurement method that we have, you know, uh, that's one of the reasons that Carlisle engage, or you see all these carriers, local carriers that they've been bought out by national firms. 
Uh, you know, Higginbotham uh, just recently bought out Gordon, and Higginbotham had bought out Swanner and Gordon. You know, uh, you know, uh, Carlisle was absorbed by Akersberg. Become in a, a, a more difficult market, so that way you're getting an attachment to the, the other carrier. Now, the challenge within our, our our system is that we go out for bids, and then we have multiple brokers. So what happens is that then again you have a situation where uh, let's say this broker out of San Antonio has a great a good relationship with a carrier and the carrier wants to stick with them and they may not know who Carlisle is and so they may have come in with an increase of sixty percent and the, uh, the the firm may have come back and says oh man that's way too high uh, what is it I'm going to have to do all this paperwork for procurement. And it's a public deal. Uh, let's go ahead and opt out. And you know that's the challenge based on the procurement system that we have. What what most agencies are moving forward to school districts, a couple of school districts, and cities is they do a request for qualification to the broker, and then they'll have the broker negotiate on itself uh, on their own, so that way they can have access to all the rest of the market. So that way they can look at that that 60% increase versus just one. So we 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 know that Carlisle got knocked out of a couple of markets because the carrier had a relationship with another broker. So by doing what we did on Friday or last week is and since Carlisle was the only proposer, um, we uh, <coughs> we contacted John Bell and said them being the only proposer. And we understand that time is the essence because it's part of July 27th and you're going to need that. Is that would we be able to allow them to continue to negotiate with other carriers on their behalf? And so uh, uh, John Bell provided that document and they're doing so. So they may be, uh, back, uh, be able to go back to other carriers and, and hopefully come back with something uh, much more competitive. So it, it's a combination, you know, Director Allison of uh, yes, the market is, has been very difficult. It, it really has. I mean, obviously, we hear our Chairman Hunter. He's always talking about windstorm, and it's a fight for all of us uh, to go before uh, TWIA. And, and so it, it, it also it, it extends to the private sector. In addition, you, you, uh, uh, you count the, the situation that we're having with inflation, uh, the, 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 how the pandemic has affected that. Uh, and then also with our procurement policy. So we're, we're, we're having a bunch of uh, different challenges that we're putting together, and then that's, that's, that's our, our, our we, we know that it's gonna be difficult. <laughs> I hope that answers all your questions. Uh, if not, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's good. I can read it, I can expand on anything else. Okay. Well, thank you. I do appreciate that. I have more of a comment. Um, you know, we have a July the 6th meeting. That's the bull board, right? That's our next board meeting. Um, at the very least, obviously it depends on this outcome today, but I mean, I think we need more information from Carlisle, from a Carlisle agent, and that, you know, perhaps some comparables to what is, you brought up the city, you brought up TCISD, <coughs> You know what are their rate increases and I mine went up 15 percent for my home in another property roughly it didn't go up 83 percent I understand that that we're in a bind and I just think that you know we have two new board members I understand coming in on July the 6th and we're just going to need some more information um, which seems reasonable and I do appreciate what um, the efforts to go out on to go the meeting you had with John Bell last Friday I'm satisfied with uh, Mr. Rendon and Councilman Barrera's explanation on the procurement process and what the staff did here so I can appreciate that you all made the effort appropriately but you know this is significant so with that that's uh, I have one question uh, Mr. Barrera what uh, or Mr. Rendon what do you think that by that July 6 meeting by allowing him to be our broker that that would give us some different numbers by then that we might be able to look at 
uh, kind of like on basically what uh, Lynn is saying that I, I agree with what she's saying that an 83% jump and without we are in a pickle and we do have uh, a duty to uh, obviously we have to be insured and I'm just trying to figure out if on that July 6 meeting we by, by doing what happened on Friday if that it will actually help us with maybe some better numbers yeah good good uh, question uh, reference to that you know my recommendation is to um, vote on this recommended to the board between now and July uh, 6 our board of, board of directors meeting we're hoping that Colorado will bring us a, a better number so when the, when it reads that not to exceed the 242 744 that's what you're voting on it right now because that's what we have it's risky for the board of directors not to move forward with this because uh, if we don't, then there's a possibility. I don't know that you know the carrier uh, uh, Carla will say, you know what, you know it is kind of risky. I might not. It shows confidence that you know we're moving it forward. Now between now and then, uh, I'm hoping that Carla, being the broker, will give us a better price. And at the uh, uh, board of directors, if we're not satisfied, you can pull it, discuss it, and then vote vote it on then. But I, I would move it forward in my recommendation. And as Roland had had, had said, I mean, we've we've had long conversations. You know, I'm not in the insurance business, but I've learned a lot from our consultant. And he asked, "Man, you asked all these excellent questions, but it's because I I need to know. I want to know." And I know uh, Director uh, Allison uh, uh, concerned. Yes, when you go from you know 10 percent, 20 percent increase, that's kind of normal. But then it goes up to 83. Uh, why didn't the other companies participate? Is because I've always said it's a high risk in, uh, insurance. And you know what if we do get a storm? You know, so we need we need the uh, insurance. That's for sure. Uh, it will expire next month. And the 27th. Um, so th those are my comments, uh, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I have some comments. He goes first. Oh. I'll go second. No, you go uh, first. I'll follow. The replacement cost obviously is going to factor into this because of the rising prices. Can you hear me? Yeah. No. Uh, so I, I get that part, that, and I think you mentioned that replacement cost obviously is going to factor in on the increase. That much, I don't know. Who is the, uh, and this is for Roland, Mr. Barrera, who is the uh, insure, the company that's going to insure this, that's proposing to insure it? Well, it's uh, not insured. Uh, there's, there's, it's over basically three carriers, uh, Lloyd's of London, uh, United Specialty Insurance Company, and Art Specialty Insurance Company. And the third one is uh, Lloyd, Lloyd's of London. Yeah, Lloyd's of London is your source. And so by becoming an, an independent uh, a broker, is that what it is? Yes. Right now he's, he, he's, he doesn't have access. Does he have access to companies? Because I know fires coming up as well, like Farmers, Allstate. Uh, they may oh, not yeah. have, they, they have. They, they do with all the car major carriers with regard to, you know, obviously Farmers and Allstate is, see what those carriers were trying to decide. It's not necessarily underwritten by Farmers or Allstate going to go into it, it'll be uh, the, it, it'll have another carrier yeah so on, yeah particularly they're working directly with those on, carriers. on the windstorm yes but not on the on the fire I think farmers and all state because uh, oh, I, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I thought we we're talking specifically about no, no the windstorm but some of them will do combination Weston is a company that we've used before uh, will that allow this now that you're a broker to be able to use them as a possible consideration and again I I think overall because of the timeline that we have I don't know that we have a choice we're kind of stuck with it but at the same time I agree with uh, with uh, director Allison that we should at the very least uh, have Carlisle here to you know because we have such a short fuse they should really be here in my opinion I mean that this is not <coughs> I, I appreciate you being there, Roland, but I don't know that you'll be able to provide all the answers 
yeah, yeah, that's, that's good too. And so, and I appreciate oh, yeah. you coming and, and, and making the presentation, but uh, Carlisle is the one that's getting paid to do this, I guess. I don't know. Maybe you are as well. Yes, sir. So, yeah. uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not on the committee, but I don't know that we have much choice. I don't like it. I think it's a huge increase, but at the same time, uh, I understand that you know we have to, and, and I think Rendon, you probably did the only thing you could have done is to yeah, what, uh, one, su submit what, that they be a broker that I, uh, to, to be a broker so that they can possibly get other pricing between now yeah. and the next one. One point to know about this insurance uh, uh, process of the windstorm, you know, for us, you know, you shop around for car house, you know, you got options, different companies, uh, but most of them, they're about, you know, give or take a few hundred. <coughs> but in this type of windstorm insurance, and I'm just going to use a very good example that I always use, you know, let's say there's five carriers and there's three of us looking for the same insurance for the RTA. But if I'm the first one to, to call these five carriers and I, I lock in two, you can only lock in two, uh, and they give me the best price, and then I have to look for the other three, one of the other three, okay? Now, if uh, customer B and C want to do the same thing, once I lock in company uh, one and two, they cannot get pricing from that. So I already got, my, I already got the low, low pricing. On, on the uh, on the windstorm, then I have to shop one of the other three, and this is what happens. That Carlisle knows that the uh, insurance is going to expire months before they, they've had it for the last four years, so they shop around early, and that's what that's what happens. Where there's, the, you know, the other companies would have to really risk it with other <coughs> companies, the other carriers, and try to and try to get them. But that's how this in insurance and the windstorm. Uh, works you know kind of like is, that is twia was was they were they not considered at all or not willing to i i find it strange that they would not be willing to submit a proposal question Answer that for uh, roland or for well, mr randall like i said the system that we have the the, the agents uh, basically submit their best proposal and of the agents that submitted there was there was none done from twia are you saying that TWIA would not submit a proposal? We're not willing to uh, submit a proposal? No. no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that that uh, what was uh, it goes back to our procurement policy, our procurement system. We're not we're not we're not bidding directly to the, the carriers. We're using an agent system of which they tell the agent to give us the best policy. And unfortunately, though, we're bidding it over several agents, and that's where the challenge is. So we 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 talk we. We may have, but we don't know because that's in the hands of the uh, of the of the broker or agent that's going to buy the proposal. Well, they were the most. I mean, and I have a smaller, I mean, much smaller property. It's nowhere near this value, but uh, Twia has been insuring it and um, more competitive than Lloyd's of London or all the other people that you mentioned. So I don't know. I, I just I'm curious why Twia would not or could not insure it, and <coughs> if we got a price from them, at least. I, I cannot imagine that if you ask for a price that they would not give you one. And so you said yeah, you only got uh, one proposal. That That's a little strange to me. I, I understand. I understand. That's what I'm saying, though. But the, the, the thing is, is that with our procurement method, we can you know, know, the procurement <coughs> method which we have and the bureaucratic practices which we have, it, it's not a one that we have direct. And that's the thing that we're recommending to you is that we assign one particular group so that way they can – they can accept all the markets and provide that but, but I still don't see anything from Twi. I think that at the very least, I know they'll quote it. They have to. Yeah, so, as far as I'm therefore, concerned. yeah, well, we, could, we could definitely get some comparison. And when Carlos comes to number six, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll ensure, I'll, I'll definitely give him a call after we're done here today. To yeah, there may be a reason, but they're not here to answer that question. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yep. I understand. Yes, sir. That's all I have. I yes. really appreciate what Director Salazar has, has brought up because it's triggering some some outward some thinking here and some brainstorming. But I do want to go back to my comment being satisfied with the, the staff fulfilling or following the procurement process of sixty days. I want it in the on the record that we need to revisit that when it comes to this type of insurance and possibly expand that to a ninety, even hundred and twenty days. I'll, I'll answer that. So procurement has a standard policy in there. 
but it depends really on the type of procurement that you're doing. You, we have suggested to various project managers to extend that period of time, and it really depends on when the, when the project manager is ready to go out for that RFP and the time frame we have between the contract expiring. We could put a procurement out there for 60 days, 45 days, or we could put it out 180 days. Mm -hmm. So it, there's nothing in the procurement method that locks in how much time you have. We have a minimum amount of time in there that we suggest all the time. Yeah, you know, we definitely need to look at that when it comes to this type of policy. This is a lesson to learn. And there's a variety yeah. of things. We could have done an RFQ like you said in the past. And, you know, that uh, Councilman Barrera said we could have done an RFP like we did here. There's mm -hmm. IFBs. There's a professional services agreement. There's a slew of different methods that we have in here. The project manager or whomever will, will help choose the, the procurement method, and mm -hmm. the procurement department will make sure the method happens properly. And, and then one other thing, just as the week continues and other conversations are had with staff and, and – and Carlisle to look at other options. I, I did some research and there may be an option to pay up, you know, 25% of the fee and then put it out again. Right. I mean, let's just try to get creative with this in the coming week. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah, one, one of the, the, uh, the good conversations we had is that for next year, we're, we're going to try and uh, get a, a broker of record. That way he would go di uh, directly right now what uh, call out insurance is, is doing for us and get the better better price. I believe Director Wolbright had some questions. Yeah, I've got a few. Uh, first of all, I wholeheartedly agree with Director Allison's suggestion that we look at a 25% fee extension because it's becoming far too common that we're getting, hey, here's our choice. It's not good, but we have to be done in 30 days, and we don't meet again before then, so take it or leave it. It's the best we can do. And that's, this isn't the first time that's happened on a six-figure contract. And I just don't think that's good leadership uh, in any way. You mentioned uh, that Carlisle shopped early. I guess I'm wondering then why are we getting this conversation with our backs against the wall if the shopping process started early? So why are we getting it now if supposedly they started shopping early? Well, the answer to that is that anybody can shop early before, uh, besides Carlisle, anybody, any insurance can go in and look for carriers. They don't have to, we don't have to put the, uh, the uh, bid out. Uh, so I'm just assuming that's what they did, and that's why they locked in the, the, the better price, even though it's outrageous, 83%. Uh, uh, but that's their... In fairness, this isn't the better price. Excuse the me? average across the industry sector over the last year, I have some friends in the industry, so I asked them, uh, the average across the sector is 20 to 50%. So we're exceeding that by almost 60% on the high end of the sector average. And I think that's noteworthy. Uh, Robert, in terms of when we've had single bids in the past, what's been our policy on RFPs that only get one bid? So typically if you get a, a single source, um, one bid that comes in here, We'll compare it to the ICE. You know, part of the process of, of doing uh, putting out an RFP and IFB is you do a scope of work so we understand the, the definition of the project, and then you do an ICE, an independent cost estimate. So you have a line item breakdown of all the factors that go into the getting the cost of it in here. So when you get that single bid in there, you'll compare it to your ICE to see if you're within a range, usually about 10% or so. If you're outside that range, then you sit there and say, hopefully we do it in early in advance where we can sit there and say, you know what, something happened in here. We, we got to toss that out, and we got to either work a different scope of work in the air, or we got to do a different method in here to try to find a better price or a better uh, end product in there. So, was that process followed here? Excuse me. Was that process followed here? Um, well, we have an ice in here. Um, the market is what it is, I guess. In here, the, the problem that we have in this case here is the contract about to expire what and you're in hurricane ice? season. What was that ice number? Uh, I'm not sure off the top it of my head. It was that 10% of, of the, uh, we paid uh, 132, so it, it was so probably like another 15, 18,000 to, to So it. let me make sure I'm understanding correctly. Our traditional policy is that if we are outside of a 10 to 20% range of the ice, which in this case is 150,000, we don't take the bid and we look for other options. In Typically. this case, that would put this price about $60,000 less on the high side. If we were sitting at a hundred eighty thousand dollar contract, we'd still would reject it. But the recommendation now is that we keep this one without exploring any other options. Well, I think the only reason why that recommendation is going on right now is because this one's about to expire and we're in hurricane season. 
That, I, I think that's the whole gist of it. Of what do we right have now. an option of extending uh, this one, like Director Allison said, for 25%? It'd be or, a premium, or but it's just. Month, maybe? Yeah, maybe. so the contract hasn't expired, so we can always talk about doing something like that. Um, we, we can call them and, 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 and have that conversation in there. It'd be interesting to see what their 25% cost would be when you're in hurricane season and trying to negotiate it at that point in time. Yeah, it would be higher. The yeah. other thing that I suggest with this contract here is don't do it at this point in time here where you're back against the wall. Try to do this early in the year so we kick it out. We have plenty of time to put it out again, and we're not in hurricane season, but we're trying to negotiate the, the highest prices because it's hurricane season. Yeah, we could put it out in, in January, Somewhere but in, you, have to pay the, you have to pay the full premium, then they would give you back yeah. Once you've uh, it, once you've used up 25 percent of that premium, then you can go uh, and request it from other carriers and see if you can get a better price, and they'll have to give you the credit. But if you do it early, then they're going to charge a 25 percent premium. Roland, you probably know more about this than I do, but that's what my agents told me. Well, I, I think I think we're kind of missing a, a, a and, and I, I, and perhaps I just didn't make myself very clear. The way the market works. You empower a professional to negotiate on your behalf. And unfortunately, the way the market works now on large, uh, large scale property ownership as the, as the transit authority, where I, I think uh, we're insuring assets of 45 million, uh, there's a limited amount of professionals that can, that can, that can, that are capable at that level. Now, what we've done in our procurement method is we've split up that market so we don't have a clear picture of what it is. So by by engaging Carlisle on an exclusive basis, that's what we did on Butler. We're engaging Carlisle on an exclusive basis so that way they can shop the market and we could really truly understand what we have. There might have been somebody that could have come in at 40%. However, part of the reason public sectors have a challenge is because of the onerous paperwork. And, you know, that, that's the thing, you know, uh, typically, you know, providing a DUNS number, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's required for all federal contracts. However, this is, this is used with local dollars. So, uh, I you know, that's something that I, I know it's, it's just very rudimentary and to go through this process when, when we're dealing with a private sector, you have an agent, have a chat with him, talk to him, and say, okay, let me see what we can do. And so, we're, we're trying to modify that with someone so that way we can empower a professional to, to do that on our behalf. Um, the fact that, it, 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 once again, it's, it's a little bit, it's, it's a lot different market when you're looking at, you know, these assets over the side. Now, we can go back to them, and, and we've done that. We can go back to them, and we can say, okay, let's say, for example, the other factors that are up. Let's, let's say, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it can, it's not. It's predicted to be a very busy storm season. That's that's a, that's a variable that goes in question. Catastrophes that, that were in 2021 are some of our, our second only to 2017, which was the highest uh, global catastrophes that we had. Um, you know, as, as well as the challenge that we're having with inflation. So you put all that market together, so we don't know that we're at that 40 or 60 percent. We don't. And it's just simply because you throw into that the procurement process that we have. It did work at one time. However, at this time, it's not, it, 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 it's making it more difficult for us to get the most competitive price. Now, I've got a few I, I, more I did, questions. I, I did speak with Carlisle yesterday with regard to uh, their, they're optimistic that they'll have uh, uh, some additional, some more competitive pricing uh, by uh, by next week. So uh, now they're optimistic. I'm not. I don't. I don't say that we'll have that. Uh, we'll have something by the six. But I'm, we're hopeful, and I can definitely ensure that they'll be here. Uh, so uh, I, hopefully that answers your question. So it doesn't. In some ways, uh, you mentioned that it's a public entity, which is fine. But we have been for the last four years, and we haven't seen eighty percent increases, and we haven't seen increases that were far beyond the industry average. The other question However, I had in the, uh, last, in the last four years, in the last four years, we've only had one bidder, and that's as a result of our procurement process. So you mentioned uh, empowering professionals to work on your behalf. What is the compensation that the broker will get on this? Typically, the broker will get ten percent. 
So roughly twenty five thousand dollars, ballpark twenty four yeah, two. Twenty four thousand two hundred seventy four dollars. What incentive and what advantage does the agency have for having an exclusive broker when their interest is for the highest contract and our interest is for the lowest contract? Uh, because of the fact, so that way they can have a level of uh, of, of confidence with the uh, with their uh, the, the the party of which they're insured that they'll have a long-term contract with those individuals because they'll feel confident in them. Now, there are several, such as how you compensate me is on a fee basis, and they, Carlisle does work on a fee basis, regardless of whatever the terms are. Well, once again, that's, that's another component that we have to look at when we're going through this other, that, that uh, when, when, when reviewing a current procurement process to be able to provide the most competitive product, the most competitive proposal is, I, I think, a big part of the challenge. So, Wait, so you said it was 10%, but you also said it was a fee basis. So what is the fee here? Is it a fee or is it 10%? Is it a fee or is it 10% or is it both? In this particular instance, it's a commission base. However, you have other options of which you could do through the procurement method of which we have not incorporated. Okay, so the commission is 10% in this case. Exactly. And then do you know, uh, Mike mentioned uh, that Carlisle was knocked out of several other areas. Do you know why? Well, once again, as I said, what in this market, uh, carriers and underwriters will stick with agents or brokers that they have a comfort level with. So let's assume that uh, Carlisle uh, wanted, to, uh, look, wanted to look at another carrier and another underwriter or another another broker had a greater experience with that with that uh, with that uh, broker, so they may have they at that point the, the the carrier will make a decision not to work with Carlisle to work with this other one that they had more experience, with. and they may have given those individuals a price, and that and that individual chose not to submit. Yeah. So wouldn't that hurt us then if? Carriers are severing their relationship with Carlisle. Wouldn't it hurt us to make them our exclusive? No, it would not. It would not because the carrier will understand then that Carlisle is the exclusive one. If they want an opportunity for the business, then uh, they will do business with Carlisle because we are giving them that direction. Uh, well, Madam Chair, I can't vote on this. I'm not on this committee, uh, but. As it stands, if it does get to the full board, I will ad adamantly be supporting a 25% fee increase to get a little more time to not make a quarter million dollar decision with our backs against the wall. A fee increase or a 25% uh, surcharge, whatever it needs to extend the contract through the hurricane season. Or, okay. That's what I would push for. It's, I'm not on the committee though, so I can't we vote on it. Off, we just need some more information. Right. On, on the get, price like increase just creative. seems one against our policy with the ICE method and I'm not sure why we're doing that. Uh, and it seems like we haven't looked at other options that fall within more expected ranges. And quadrupling the fee increase while the rest of the industry doubled it seems extremely high. Uh, Director Wilbright, obviously, even though not on the committee, your comments are always appreciated. And you will be voting one way or another soon. So uh, it's good to have yes. a heads up on, on what we're going to be looking at in the future, uh, next couple of weeks. Uh, that being said, uh, is there a motion uh, either to authorize uh, the chief executive officer or designee to award a contract to Asquire LLC doing business as Carlisle for windstorm and hail insurance for the fiscal year 2022-23? Or is there any other motion? <coughs> so moved. Is that a mo motion to approve? Yes. Is there a second? No second. Uh, the motion fails. Can the chair not put a put a second up there? I'm uh, sorry to put it back on you. Yeah, the chair <laughs> don't can, throw anything but, at me. But I, I kind of echo the same decisions, and and I don't. I have a, kind of what you say. We're responsible to the to a group of people, and I do understand that we are in a pickle because we are 60 days, and we are. Uh, I do appreciate Director Woolbright's comments and your comments and uh, Director Salazar's comments about the 25% and extending 
an 83% increase is huge. Uh, I'm not saying that we're not going to go with this, but I do think that there was some things done on Friday that might enhance our position yeah. that will bring it down from the 83 to something else. And I do believe that because, uh, you know, we are responsible for that, and 83% is a huge increase, and uh, I would just like a little bit I more time also. So I do not second it either. Madam Chair, Dan, could, could I maybe add a comment here? Absolutely, so Chairman. This has a way of possibly moving forward. I understand, you know, we have the full board meeting on July 6th. If we don't have all the information still there, how long, uh, uh, Mike or Roland, you know, our deadline is July 26th? 27. <coughs> 27. How, many, how long, backing up from that date, how long does it take the insurance carrier to lock in the insurance? Where I'm going with this, if we don't have all the information by July 6th, I can always call a special meeting to consider the new, new uh, that is correct. rates. Yeah, because I guess that's my concern, right? If what's what's our um, game plan going forward? Because I'm with y'all, right? The 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 increase is astronomical. Um, I just want us to have an option to get to give Carlisle some time to come back with some different rates, and then we can evaluate that on July 6th. And then if we have to take a 25% option to look at what our options are, I think it's I think it's absolutely. Re I, mean, I mean, it's it's very tough to have to negotiate during the middle of hurricane season or right before that. And so, yeah. you know, to, to kind of everybody else's comment, you know, being able to look at this when we actually have time and when we are not, <laughs> you know, staring down the face of uh, potentially multiple hurricanes, I think that obviously will give us back our leverage. Um, but I guess that, you know, if, if we don't vote on this today, and this is just a you know, point of information, I'm just a request, I, I mean, because I'm still very new to this. If we don't go f move forward with this today, I guess what is, our plan of it action can be passed on an emergency sense. basis at the board meeting. I'm and sorry, what was that? It can be passed on an emergency basis. Okay. Even if it fails today, yes. it can be carried on to the July 6th agenda. Absolutely. As an emergency yes. item, it doesn't yes. require a second reading. Got it. Got it's it. It's in the direction it. of the chair, so Dan could do it. Got it. Okay. And then Thank the you. other question I had um, regarding that, so I didn't completely understand what was signed Friday. Are we still able to go to other brokers and see if they can get us a better, more competitive offer? Um, Roland? Well, I, I would say that, you know, once this number is out there, it would be, uh, I don't know, difficult. Uh, when you have a, a, a number already, then the other brokers would, would uh, know this number, and I don't think it's... Uh, well, this it's is a not to exceed a, number. For, in reference to procurement, Robert, uh, once you have a number out there, uh, how does that work? Because well, I already I, know your number. I think you're talking two different things here. Um, you're talking a number here, and I think you're talking about another broker. And I think we just signed a, an agreement with yes. Carlisle to be the broker, so it's hard to sit there and say we're going to another broker when we have broker of record already. Yeah. So without board well, approval, we signed an exclusive yeah, agreement. I'm sorry. That's an alternate procurement method. That's an alternate procurement method. You know, if, if, if you want to do that, my, 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 my recommendation has been because we've had these challenges. Because we had a, a significant increase last year. Is that um, we, 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 we review our procurement method as that of which we look for the best qualified brokers. In order to do one, you, you went through a process basically just to ask uh, several brokers to take a proposal. And unfortunately, under the current system, it's very difficult to do that. So you, you, you had several brokers submit, and unfortunately, they have to make a decision whether or not they want to submit because it, they, they don't know what the market is. So just, I want to make sure I'm understanding. Four days before this meeting, when we were going to vote on this, we signed an agreement without taking it to the board that binds our hands to only work with one broker. Is that accurate? Um, yes, because after discussion with legal counsel, uh, it was uh, felt that that was the best recommendation for the board. To see, because the only proposal that was received based on the current procurement method was this price of $242,744. Um, we could not have engaged in that process. And we could not, we could have just, uh, this could have been recommended at $242,744. It 
without any additional options, then we could have gone through another procurement process, very similar to this one, which did not, which once again may or may not have yielded. So what our attempt in doing so was to provide you with an option to improve on the 242-744. If you like, you can approve the 242-744 at this time, and then we can probably initiate a new process to choose a new broker to empower us to do that. Well, I believe this motion already failed. So we'll be looking at a different... I believe this motion already... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm not recommending that. I'm giving you the options of what you could have done. Whether or not it failed or not doesn't mean that we can approve it this time. My deal is that staff took some initiative to be able to try and improve on the 242-744. Was there any incentive? Oh, wait. They could have not engaged with a broker of record letter with Carlisle. They could have foregone that and brought this to you under the current procurement method. So that's the option. So my question is... And that would give you additional options. All right. So my question is very simple. What was the advantage of doing it Friday versus after today? Why not make that a motion for this committee to consider? I mean, are there quotes that came in the last three days that we couldn't have gotten tomorrow? No, no. The advantage was, once again, time is of the essence. There's a holiday week coming. In order to do so, I mean, you can... I'm sure you can direct staff to withdraw their direction if you so chose. I mean, we're talking about one business day, right? Because Monday was a holiday. So effectively, by going Friday, we got Tuesday's worth of work, and then we have a meeting this morning. It just seems like that was a pretty small reward for signing an exclusive agreement without taking it to the board at all, which I get totally under the authority. It just seems with this level of increase, I don't see the advantage. Director Wolbright, I welcome those challenges. Once again, this is a committee, so therefore it would have had to have gone to the board to be able to make the best decision. That's a good point. So it's not just one business day. It's not just one business day. We would have looked at anticipating that versus... Let me go back to the level. If we did this on Friday the 17th, and this would have had to have gone before the board, then you're looking at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven business... Yeah, nine business days, because it still has to go before the board. Fair point. Either way, not my committee, so I can't vote. I'm just going to be quiet now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That brings us to item agenda number seven, the committee chair report. Basically, I do thank everybody for all their input today. It's definitely very interesting. Also, thanks to staff and Councilman Barrera. I know everybody's working hard, and hopefully we can resolve this issue at the July 6th meeting. Is there anybody else that has any comment? Well, the only comment I have is the only good thing is usually we have this committee meeting on the fourth week of the month, which we're having now, but this particular month it has by Wednesday. So he's going to give us two weeks to hopefully Carlisle can work, do their due diligence, work hard, and try to get a better price. So by the board meeting on the 6th, we're hoping to get a better price on this, and if it does, then we'll present that, and then we'll go from there. I think Director Salazar suggested, or Director Allison, to go to the Texas Winds Forum and get a quote from them. Yes, that's all. So we'll have that number hopefully pretty quickly also. Correct. Can we have Carlisle at the board meeting so that they can speak? Yes, we'll. I hope the message gets across that we would like them present on July 6th. Procurement sent them a call them, and they said they were out of town this time, but they'll probably be at the board meeting in there. They could have come on like Councilman Brera. Yeah, I'm just saying the message we got from them. Yeah, we did. I asked Procurement to invite them, and they couldn't be here, and of course Mr. Barrera is out sick, but hopefully everything will come to the lane where we'll have a good presentation, more detail, and God willing, a better number. So that concludes the meeting for administration and finance at 926. Thank you.
take a five minute break uh, or are you ready? Who's? <laughs> we have a quorum. Hey, Matt, get back oh, Matt's here. here. <laughs> we'll wait till Matt to get in. <laughs> the boss leaves and we get uh, a one item almost one hour. <laughs>
Yeah, talking to golf. Talk He's better than I am at golf. Wait a lot. I'm sure the meetings are. This is going to go real fast. <laughs> we took too, too long in one night. <laughs> okay, okay, we're going to open up the Operations and Capital Projects Committee. Uh, Ms. Montiel, uh, roll call. Here. Here. Leslie. Matt Wilbright. Present. Okay, item two, Mr. Rendon. Here, here. Assistant. Safety briefing. Good morning, everyone, again. Uh, in the event of an emergency, we will exit the boardroom to my right, your left, proceed toward the west stairwell down to the first floor where you will exit through the west doors. Once outside, we will continue towards the clock tower adjacent to the transfer station. Marisa will account for all the board members, and I will be the last one out to make sure everyone gets out. Three things to remember. Please do not use the elevator during an emergency. Please do not return until the all clear has been given. And if we need to shelter in place, we will do so in the west stairwell. Thank you. Thank you. Opportunity for public comment. Uh, do we have any item for public comment? Item five, discussion and possible action to approve the operations and capital projects committee meeting minutes of May 25th, 2022. Do we have a motion? I'll make a motion. We have a motion by B. We have a second. Second, second by Mr. Wilbright. Any other discussion on this item? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, item six is discussion and possible action to recommend to the board of directors to authorize the chief executive officer or designee to award contracts to CD Starter Service LLC coming Southwest Plains and Gillick for external and internal engine parts. All right. Good morning, everyone. The board priority for this is public image and transparency. The background, we have about 1,900 plus unique replacement parts that are in a variety of different segments, including instrumentation, vehicle body, drivetrain, electrical, engine motor systems, accessories. All the replacement parts are OEM or approved equal. The contract agreements help us with volume discounts and firm pricing. And these are for multiple contracts and defined categories of external engine parts, which include turbos, exhaust gas, recirculation coolers, et cetera, and internal engine parts, which are cylinder heads, pistons, rods, and other seals. The current contract expires in this month, and this contract will be for one year, and that's in good part due to the, the volatile pricing we've seen, especially with uh, some of the internal external parts with the uh, Cummins. There is no DBE requirement. And the total expenditures are determined by actual usage and funding historically includes combined resources from the federal preventative maintenance of 5307 and local funds. And the funds are allocated in the board approved annual operating budgets. The estimated one year project cost is $136,750. Here are the recommended awardees for contract. We have CD Starter Service, which is out of Victoria. They have 561 parts that they bid on with a total price of $7,259.99. Come in Southern Plains, which is the, the bulk of the parts, which 1,348 parts, and about $100,382. And Gillig, which bid on 862 parts at $29,107.59 for the total of $136,750. With that, staff requests the Operations and Capital Projects Committee recommend the Board of Directors authorize the Chief Executive Officer, CEO, or, or designee to award contracts to CD Starter Service, LLC, Cummins Southern Plains, and Gillig for external and internal engine parts. With that, I'll take any questions. Any questions from the board, from the committee? Yeah, please. i make a motion to follow staff's recommendation. I'll second. Motion by Mr. Wilbright to approve the recommendation. We have a second. I'll second. Second by Ms. Chato. Any other discussion on this item? All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Mr. Chair, uh, Director Gonzalez is here. You joined to online. Oh. Yeah. Better now. At least he was there a second ago. 
chair there, but I don't know. Oh, I saw him. Thank you. There he is. Item number seven. Discussion and possible action to recommend to the board of directors to authorize the chief executive officer or designee to enter into inter-local agreement with Dallas Area Rapid Transit for a go-pass prescription and license. Again, sir. All right. The board priority for this item is innovation. So for some background, obviously staff in the board here are seeking to continuously improve the rider experience. We want to modernize our fare payment and trip planning options by providing a mobile app that can do both. DART developed GoPass with a company called Unwire and implemented the first iteration, which was GoPass 1.0 in 2013. And I was actually at Trinity when we were started utilizing that along with them. And then an all-demand scheduling component was offered and began being offered in 2019 through a partnership with Spare. Currently, this is used by five Texas tra transit agencies and one in Oklahoma. It is DART, Trinity Metro, which is Fort Worth, DCTA, which is Denton, Star Transit, which is essentially like the Real, which services the rural counties outside of Dallas, and Lubbock was added last year, and then there's Tulsa. There are other agencies that are also using it through a white label agreement, which basically means they're not listed with the other agencies. It doesn't have DART's logo or any of the other Texas agencies. So we have like Charlotte in North Carolina is using it, and there's a, one of the agencies that surrounds Minneapolis and that just began, signed on to begin using it. And there are a couple other Texas agencies that they're talking to, but I don't want to throw it out there since there's no signed agreement. So history of the, the GoPass mobility platform. So as I mentioned, in 2013 is when the first iteration came out. It was very basic. It, you, you bought a ticket, you showed it to the operator, and it, you could list some special events. But one of the purposes was it being a regional app, which is one of the first in the country, and that because there's regional passes that go across the DFW area and on the rail systems and bus systems. In 2014, they added the admission tickets, like being able to buy tickets to the state fair and other special events in the area. And one of the unique things I think that we could benefit from uh, for our community is that Lubbock is currently selling Texas Tech football tickets th through the app. So obviously that's something that we could consider doing with our university or the American Bank Center and so forth. In 2015, they added deep linking with Uber, Lyft, and Zipcar. Really, that was just a very basic iteration that showed where the vehicles were at in services and estimated wait times. Then in 2016, they introduced the corporate and university passes. So essentially, you could sign it, you have a deal with the business district for a pass that lasts a year, and it would automatically be on there, or a particular company, say Shell, or somebody else wanted to buy their employees a monthly pass, it would show up just for that employee. Our universities can do the same, and they actually can see more granular data as far as which one of their students are using the, right, you know, the pass. And then 2017, they were given an FTA grant to improve the service. 2018 is when uh, GoPass 2.0 came out, which included the real-time um, trip planning, so you can see where your vehicles were at and such. It, an important option, I think, for, for us in on all of Texas is to cash the mobile. So not everybody has credit cards or bank accounts. So if you have a, a, a GoPass account, they've set up agreements in the DFW area and others in the northern area with the like Fiesta, 7-Eleven, the Cash Express, and a couple other places where you can go there and basically give them 20 bucks or whatever you have, and they, they, they can preload it onto your, your card or your account. It also enables the pass, go pass enables fare capping, which basically what that is is so not everybody can afford a monthly pass premium the price at one time, so it, which is $30 for us right now. So if they're paying 75 cents or buying a day pass at $1.75, it won't let them go past the, the monthly pass amount. Or we can set that as you buy single trips up to the point where you don't go past the day trip uh, uh, amount. And also, you can utilize Apple Pay and Google Pay, and of course, it has its own GoPass wallet. Then 2019 is actually when they, they started signing on with other transit agencies, so Charlotte s began the process in 2019 with them, and they actually won an, an APTO Innovation Award in 2019. And this is where they s truly started to get to multimodal, where you could plan a trip and it would show you, okay, you ride a, take the Uber to this point, 
get on the rail to this point, get on the bus to here, and then there's five scooters at, at these different points, and you can grab the scooter to get the basically the last mile to your house. And in 2020, they continued the expansion with uh, national partnerships. In 2021, the uh, flexible mobility, which uh, what that does is it allows you to basically book more trips to more of the third-party providers like Uber and, and Lyft, but you had to use the Uber, Uber or Lyft accounts. And then an, another big option that we're interested in is the eLerts integration, which is basically like a see something, say something. So it gives the customers a chance to provide input on safety and security concerns. They can do it anonymously or with their contact information through the app. And then there's the web trip planner and some other options that came out. And then in 2022, one of the, you really got into mobility as a service where you can use one app to book every, every trip that you need, which is basically what APT is recommending for agencies. So now you can actually book through Uber or Lyft without having an Uber or Lyft account. If you have a GoPass account, you can book and pay for the bus ride and the Uber trip all, all at one time on there. And you also have the ability now that if you want to create rewards programs, you can do that and, and add other special events that are related to the transit agency. So for the identified need, currently we do not offer a mobile application for a fair payment. And then, as I mentioned, we'll enhance the customer service in several ways, which includes offering a cashless fair payment system, fair capping, multimodal trip planning, fair payment and trip planning in one app, and the ability to address safety and security concerns through the app submittal. And we also have the ability for in-app and push messaging to customers, which could include weather alerts, it could include holiday service changes, or any type of emergency service change that we, we may have to make, it would push it through just like in, any other alerts. And it also, you have the ability to create the affiliate passes for corporations, students, groups, or even potentially conferences that are being held at the American Bank Center. So on the right is just an example of a ticket that's basically been active, activated, and it's got a countdown timer that the operator can see. And as we progress with newer um, fare boxes on our, our vehicles, you can use a QR code scanner as well for the fare box to scan. And if approved by the CCRTA board on July 6th, we will begin sending the necessary data and information to DART. Well, it'll take some time to get to their board process. They're, they're um, positive that they won't have any issues there, so they want to help us get through this as fast as possible. So it'll go in front of DART's committee on July 12th. And then because of the way their July boards and, and committees are scheduled, it actually go in front of DART's full board for approval on August 23rd, but we'd, we'd be working on it in the background. And then it, the goal is to have it implemented at the end of October. And here on the bottom are just some examples of the screens. Again, you're seeing the 24 hour pass on the side. And then once it's activated, you see that the timer countdown on there. And the next to that is just an example of part of the city where it's showing the multiple ways of trip or types of trips that you would take. And then it gives you options on the different types of passes that are available. Obviously, in the Metroplex, you have a lot more variation in fares. And then on the right, this is actually dashboards that the staff would get to utilize. So one of the unique things with the mobile apps is since they're using a phone, you can actually track the data of where they're at when that pass is being bought or where they're at when that pass is being activated. So in a sense, you're able to get a lot more granular data on, on the ridership and the people who are using the mobile app. There is no DBE requirement for this. Total expenditures will be determined by the fees established in their local agreement and actual transactions by our customers, and I'll go over some of that in the next slide. This project will use lo local funds, and the funds are allocated in the board approved annual operating budgets. The estimated first year project cost is 110825 and I'll break that down. And your interlocal will be an annual auto renewing agreement that can be terminated with proper notification by either party. So this is a, a breakdown of the cost. So for the initial setup of the GoPass app, there is a $35,000 one-time charge. And the hosting fees are 54,000 annually. Then there's a, a GoPass customer facing website, which basically allows you to access your money accounts to the website, not just the app, or if you want your parents to have access so they can preload the, the account for you. So that would be something we'd want to implement, which is the 4,800 a year. And then you get into the, the revenue sharing here. So there were some assumptions I made. We budgeted 1250000 in it for this year. So I used that assumption. 
with a 10% adoption in year one and the increase in the 25% in year two, 35% in year three. So very generalized. So you can see that the costs are minimal with the revenue sharing fee is 2% and the credit card interchange fees are 2.5%. One of the things with working with another public agency that's beneficial is that when you look at the um, private company apps, they're usually the fees are between seven and nine percent total, and then they end up charging a fee if your fares are below a certain amount, usually about two dollars. We, we know our fares are among the lowest in the country, if not the lowest, so we're going to get the penalty, you know, with any of those. Then you, you get down to the add-on items we want to add in year one. One is the, the e-alerts that we talked about, the see, see something, say something. There's a one-time activation fee of $5,000, and then an annual fee of $2,400. And then for anything that's off the wall that they haven't seen before, there is a fee of $200 per hour, so I just put in an amount. That way, in case we want some customization that's not going to be built into this. And then in phase two, after we've got everything working here, they do have a, a trip planning website that I put in there, which is 24,000. Now, we do offer, have a, a website for trip planning for Transloc, but obviously, if everything works out here, we'd like to combine that into to, to one method. And then, the, one of the, the, what I think is one of the most beneficial items later down the road is, because of the partnership with Spare, they have an on-demand scheduling service app that's part of this. There's a $7,000 fee for um, setting it up, and then a $9,000 annual fee. So basically, what, what DART did in that through a couple different system redesigns is that they now have 31 go link zones, so that they've got rid of 3,000 bus stops and converted about 230 square miles of their service area to, which were in lower ridership fixed route areas, to on-demand services. And they have about 45% of their customers that are using this app now, and they can schedule the services, and they'll even divert them to, to Uberpool. They'll have the option of taking <coughs> their go link vehicle or Uber pool and show the price difference and the, how long it takes for, for each one of those services. And even uh, Lubbock is getting ready to start utilizing this for their paratransit service right now. So with that, uh, the staff requested the operation of the Capital Projects Committee recommend the Board of Directors authorize the Chief Executive <coughs> Officer or designee to enter into an interlocal agreement with Dallas Area Rapid Transit for Go Pass subscription and license. And I'll take any questions that you have. Any questions from the board? You know, I've been, asking, I've been asking for this for four years, so, you know, I'm thrilled with it. Um, just out of curiosity, what is the cost to white label it and put our logo on it? Do we have any idea? I don't have that. There are some additional charges. But one of the benefits of this is that we'll show up next to all those other transit agencies. So you can essentially plan your trip. If, say we added Greyhound or Airlines, you could essentially plan your trip from wherever you live in Dallas to going here. And I, and a couple of the other cities that they're talking to right now, if they get added, we'd be part of that. So you basically have one wallet that works, you know, through a good part of Texas. Okay. So there's an advantage just to not white labeling is what I'm hearing? Yes. Okay. And if anybody logs into the app, whether it's in West Texas or DFW, or if they get it on East, East Texas or any, any of the other Western Texas cities, we'd be listed right then and there in our special events. You know, because somebody could sign up to alert to what's going on at the American Bank Center or whatever we're, we're posting. I love it. I'll make the motion. A second. The motion by Mr. Wilbite and a second by Ms. Caro. I have a couple of comments in the discussion. Um, and again, a lot of this was answered at the pre committee meeting. Uh, other companies make sure that we have that transparency uh, discussion where you did actually research other companies and this was the one that was best utilized. Hopefully, you can do a don't have to do it today, you know, but to let us know at the regular meeting, just to let the rest of the board members know that you did do your due diligence and look at other companies. Um, and also, maybe you mentioned it briefly, uh, is what percentage of passengers are currently using the apps that we currently have? Of the, our Transloc app? Yes, sir. All right, we'll, we'll look to pull some of that data. If, if you could just give us, an, you know, what percentage is using it? and also the projected increase in revenues as a result of what you're proposing to utilize, uh, just to give us some type of idea. Those are the only, I think it's a great project. And one other thing is just, and I don't know if it's even out there, where they could have a, a little board at, it, at some of the major stops where it would trigger a, a, a signal to some kind of board that people would know it's, it's five minutes away or it's at this stop. Is that, is that something that's 
utilized we, anywhere? We, we actually do have a, a few of them out there. Say the Hector P. Garcia bus stop has what we call a smart stop that has a display. And we, we've got a couple other locations where we're trying out a couple different companies' technologies out there. Just curious. I mean, I just because most people, or say more than half of the people, don't utilize the app, I'm assuming that's why I wanted to let you know. But I think it's a great project, as Mr. Wolbart mentioned. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, the committee chair report, I aye. have none. Uh, excited about this uh, this app I think it's going to be great and uh, any comments from the committee Adjourn at 9 50.